All right, Jordan Fields joining me on the pod today. It's about time, man. How how's it taking this long? I have no idea. It's I feel like I'm finally seeing the man behind the curtain, right? Like the <laughs> Wizard of Oz, or like, or like I found the golden ticket. So here I am. I did it. Yeah, it's a big deal, man. Yeah, that's a huge. Deal. I finally let you in. So I am glad you're here. You're one of my oldest, like strong business relationships. That's like ultimately a friendship at this point. And I feel like you have so many good stories to to share. So much success. So I expect a good like half hour, 45 minutes of basically knowledge that's going to unlock everything for every, everybody that's listening. Wow. Well, you're really putting the pressure on, but we'll see what we can, <laughs> we'll see what we can do. Absolutely. And I, I agree. I remember my first quote unquote first day on the job, reaching out, reaching out to you and be like, Hey, we should like grab lunch. And now here we are. How many years later than 12, 13, 14 years later. So awesome. It is awesome. And I actually give you a lot of credit for that because you say it like, Oh, Hey, I reached out. We should have, beers it's like dude i didn't know that you know what i mean like we didn't have a relationship before that you know like um what are we like seven years apart like we never were in school together or anything like that growing up you you were in school with my brother but i do remember you reaching out because again i'm in mortgages your your insurance at the time and like it makes sense for people like us to be connected so like when you reached out i was like oh check with my brother i'm like who's this guy jordan fields he reached out to to meet up and obviously Matt had great things to say and the rest is history. But I do give you a lot of credit for reaching out because a lot of people maybe don't reach out, you know, and it's been a good relationship for both of us. Absolutely. And yeah, Matt probably just remembers me as the guy that was trying to take his high school football number. So and I did, <laughs> I did successfully do that for, for a year once, once he moved on, but that's probably what he remembers. The old 23? The old 23. And then coach Kierick convinced me that I needed to wear his old high school number when I was a senior at 33. So I was, you know, all, yeah. You know, I moved around a little bit, but no loyalty yeah. to the 23. I don't know if you, you know, I don't know what's up with that. <clears throat> Sorry, MJ. <laughs> but that was back when you had long hair, right? Like, I wish I could, yeah. I wish I could show your driver's license picture on this podcast. The before and after, and I was trying to figure out if I was going to be a rock star or a, a mop at Biddeford High School, like <laughs> physically. Yeah. I wasn't sure. <laughs> I wasn't sure where the podcast would go to start, but can we talk about you being in a boy band and what that's like? You were, you kind of are like, you know, like this is like in sync level type stuff. Yeah. Oh, long before K pop and in sync, there was the Gloria Red Man, which is my pseudo heavy metal band in, from guys comprised of Bitterford Misako. And, you know, we thought at one point we we're going to have to make a decision do we go to college or, or pursue music? And obviously, football and college won out. But, you know, there's still fond days. You know, I'm listening to music. I'm like, yeah, that could have been me, man. Could have been me. <laughs> Dude, like being in a band. Like, so I feel like there's there's the band path or the sports path. And you kind of were able to like walk that line between both of them. It's like, you know, it's a pretty, pretty unique skill. Listen, man, in high school, I was, you know, captain of the hockey and football team, but I was also in jazz band. So <laughs> this is, this is just, you can do, you can do both. Then That's it, Jordan anyone, Fields. To anyone listening, you, you can do both. <laughs> Love it. So like I was saying, we know each other through business and insurance. Like that's what you have been doing. You've been in that world one way or another since that time it's been like you said 13 or 14 years now let's walk through your little path of your post high school life you know what happened yeah yeah so before my aspirations as a child of being a nfl player or part of backstreet boys you know i, I wanted to be an insurance agent really yeah. when i was a child yeah. yeah i always always have it was on my my you know the dream boards that you put together insurance agent was up there no, you know, I, I don't think anyone, you know, unless you're in the family business and there's a clear, you know, you're, you're, it's a family business and there's a clear path. I don't think anyone has dreams and aspirations of being in the insurance business. But once you get there, it is really a very, not, not to mention just, you know, you know, obviously there's, there's, it can be lucrative in, in the right path, but almost all walks of a career exist in the market and in that industry, that ecosystem really helps support. I mean, everything, whether it be underwriting, actuarial studies, sales, leadership, you know, yeah. product design. And, you know, I've been fortunate in marketing, you know, and I've been fortunate to to kind of get my hands, my hands in, in a lot of those different facets of the industry. And I'll share a little bit more about that because mm -hmm. it kind of really has laid the foundation for my business now and where I'm at now. But, you know, so actually, you know, we're telling stories. So when I graduated from college, I went to Endicott College, I uh, had an international finance degree. I thought, I, I, honestly, I'm like, I'm going to be a stockbroker, right? That was my move back to Biddeford after college, <clears throat> move back in with, with my mom, you know, and my, my first job out of college was, well, I was a welder. 
right? So I was. I remember this, man, with Coach Dana Coach Pack. Pack. Yep. Yeah, Dana Pack. Yeah, Dana Iron Works. Yeah, we were in the yeah. mills in Biddeford. I was waking up at four in the morning. You got, you know, local folks can just envision this driving down to the mill, 5 a.m., middle of February, you know, blistering cold winds coming off the river and hauling, mm -hmm. you know, aluminum I beams off of a flatbed and, you know, cutting steel and, and welding it. And, and, you know, part of me, I love that. I love the, the, the trades. You know, my father's a director at Westbrook Vocational Center and we've yeah. I've grown up, have, you know, feeling very strongly about you know, young kids, especially at high school age, engaging in the trades. I think it's, especially now, I mean, look at, look at, look at our, you know, economy and look at, you know, our, our, just locally, the opportunity in the trades is tremendous for, for kids and, and anybody really that has a specialty that they are passionate about. But, yeah. you know, so for me, <clears throat> I loved it. And I was playing men's league hockey up in Portland and I, I broke my leg. And that's, uh, you know, when you're, Tough to haul steel when with one leg, so needed to like find one of one of the times you broke your leg. <laughs> one of the first time, the first leg, the first yeah. time. Yeah, my slew of injuries. You know, you and I, Randy, know. I mean, obviously, we both play college football. I mean, there's there's probably a lot of hidden injuries that I don't even yeah. like count as an injury at this point because of some yeah. of the other things that have happened. But yeah, so you know, <laughs> my mother was. On, I needed to get a job. I was on the phone with her insurance agent who worked at Liberty Mutual. It was. And their friends, my mother's a teacher, had actually taught this particular individual's daughter. She was telling the story about me, and he's like, have him come in for an interview. And sure enough, I did. And my grandfather drove me on a Monday while I was in a full suit and a full leg cast to an mm -hmm. interview. And I got That's the fun. job. I was with Liberty Mutual. Great company, great training. Did that for a few years, but real, you know, really wanted to build a local business. And working for the big national carrier, nothing wrong with that. You can definitely represent locally. Mm -hmm. But it, it was kind of building a business for the machine. It really wasn't building yeah. a business for, for myself. So from there, I moved to MetLife. <clears throat> I had a great opportunity. I actually ran the MetLife Auto and Home Office in, uh, back in the mills on the Soco side this time for a number of years. Yeah. And that's when you and I kind of re really reconnected. Yeah. And then from there, you know, moved into Portland. There was an opportunity to take over a book of business up there. You know, 24-year-old, you know, wanted to be in Portland and, you know, do the Portland thing. Met my wife girlfriend at the time we moved to Portland yeah. and did the, you know, ran it, ran an agency, you know, at, at one point I had three or four employees and, and was loving it. And I had the opportunity, it was kind of tapped on the shoulder to move into a leadership position. Yeah. Um, so at that point in time, I became uh, the regional manager for MetLife. So I oversaw all the MetLife agents in Maine, New Hampshire, and Vermont, and loved it, loved doing that. I was a yeah. peer, I was able to really engage with them on their level. I was an agent. I'd done it for eight years, very fortunately, very successfully. So they were looking to me for insights and Randy, a lot of that was around networking and things that you and I had done there, oh. whether it be through our BNI chapter or creating other networking groups. And, and how do you build a business organically as opposed to like the digital marketing? How do you really do it locally? Yeah, leads online or cold yeah, calling. Yeah, yeah, it was so, it was so important. So I was coaching a lot of recruiting, training and managing large agencies. <clears throat> and then fast forward to a few years ago, MetLife sold their business to farmers insurance. So when farmers came in, I pivoted over there. I became the regional director for farmers. My market grew to all of New England. Uh, mm -hmm. Most recently, was managing 187 agents. You know, you know, almost 100 million in premium um, in five states. So really yep. enjoyed that. But the time was right to make a change. And when that time came, you know, I, I kind of look back on my days of running the business and sales and helping local people in the community with their insurance needs to. <laughs> How do I do that for business owners? Yeah. Um, and Atlantic Financial Consultants was born. So currently operating as the president and CEO of Atlantic Financial Consultants. We work with all businesses, primarily auto and home, commercial, you know, insurance agencies. We help yep. with business planning, succession planning, acquisition planning. We give them opportunities for distribution that they may not have realized on their own and, and really just kind of help them with whatever they need. Yep. Um, drive revenues, help them with staff. You know, we kind of do everything. We're the one-stop shop for those agencies, their customers, whether they're individuals or businesses, because of the, the scale of what we do and my relationships with other businesses, we can support mm -hmm. them with literally anything. So yeah. There's that sounds like a pretty unique business model. Or, or, or correct me if I'm wrong, is, is what you do fairly unique in the market or has, has there been other companies and that was kind of your template for the whole thing? Or did this come to mind? On your own. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a good question. <clears throat> Fair. I mean, there's, there's insurance consultants. They're really more focused on 
succession and acquisition planning, right? I want to buy an agency, I want to sell an agency. How do I value it? How do we actually do that? And, and, and I do do that. However, I think it was more about really rolling up my sleeves with these business owners. Mm -hmm. it, it's a really, I, you've had some incredible insurance folks on the, pod, on the podcast before. Yeah. I think of Jeff Lee with Farmers. I think of Katie Sherman. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure there's others. Those are the two that just kind of most recently come to mind. Yeah. <clears throat> They're great. And they are, are heads are down trying to run their business, help their customers out. It's, it's a trying time in insurance, right? Inflation rates are high. Everyone's experiencing it, you know? I'm an I own an insurance consulting firm and I'm dealing with my own homeowner's policy right now, right? Well, yeah. So it happens to everybody. Nobody's insulated from it. Um, but how do we help them in a way where they can focus on their core business and make more money doing that and really help their customers? And really that's what we're doing. So it's unique in that we're not charging a big consulting fee up front. We're helping them identify opportunities for distribution, whether it be life insurance or annuities or financial planning document review for their business customers who probably haven't looked at that since they started their business 20 years ago, or maybe yeah. their father, grandfather, or their, their, their grandmother did that, mm -hmm. you know, so it's, it is very unique. I wouldn't say it's revolutionary, but it's definitely unique. Yeah. Yeah. And probably for me, like I'm not in that world. So I guess, you know, there is, like you said, business consultants and insurance consultants and all that stuff. I guess being someone that has known you from day one, this has just been, been a departure of what you've done in the past in a very exciting way. So what's it been like for you? to go down this road? I mean, is this like uh, butterflies in your stomach, excited, you know, are you nervous? Like what's, what's that been like to start a new business that's a little bit off of what you've previously done? It, I guess my answer dovetails in your last question. So it, it's, I've, I've run businesses before, I've run insurance mm -hmm. agencies. This is exciting in a totally different way where I, you know, where there's a clear path, if you're running an agency, there's, there's a proven, there's, there's proven metrics, right? Like if I, if I do step one, then step two, and I'll be successful as long as I am, and I stick to it and I do it over time, you know, I can be very wildly successful. When you're starting a business, is, is anyone that's listening to this that has, or is, or is thinking about it, you know, when I wake up on, on that first Monday, it's, what do I do? Yeah. <laughs> you know? So I have a, I have a, pay, a path and a vision and fortunately it's going incredibly well. Frankly, moving even faster than I thought. I, we're, we're doing things right now that I, I had in my business plan as a five, six, seven year opportunity. They're, they're happening in the, the first year of the business. Yeah. Um, and again, that's just a lot of, a lot of it's just leaning on prior relationships. You know, folks kind of have seen my, you know, my, my career path where we're at now. And, 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 you know, I can reference some of my success in the past to kind of overcome maybe some of the stigma. Right. I mean, a lot of insurance consultants have been in the business for their whole career. They're semi-retired and here comes the 35 year old kid. Like, what does he know? But yeah, we overcome that with, with knowledge. I spend a lot of time with designation, with, with studying the market. So when I walk in, I, I, I know enough to be quite dangerous when I'm having those conversations. So yeah, it's, it's incredibly rewarding, you know, working with business owners, working with insurance alliances, right. Uh, large, larger groups of agencies starting to get some some synergy with businesses outside of just the auto and home commercial kind of property and casualty world, just saying, Hey, listen, I, I think there's a skill set here, whether it be data mining, business planning that we could leverage and, and kind really? of getting people reaching out to us, which is really interesting, you know, whether it be accounting firms, we're, we're in conversations with a trucking company, right? It's like, yeah. how do we, how do we hire and afford and become diversified and differentiated in the market to retain, retain staff and, you know, there's a lot of really creative ways we can we can help them do that. So, so talking to an accounting firm or a trucking company is that one of those examples of things that were like five six years down the road and now here you are in the first year? Because that seems yeah. to me to be a lot different than the insurance companies. You know, it's, it's just... yeah, it's totally different, right? I mean, I think valuing valuing of business, document review, kind of looking. I mean, for example, we had a conversation the other day with the with it was there was three owners in the business. It was a family business, so like the great grandson was one of the owners, and then two other partners that weren't related. And we looked at the documents, and essentially what they were, were talking about was you're now leaving it up to based on how the document was written years ago. You're leaving it up to one of your business partners to determine if you are disabled. Mm -hmm. That's a really challenging <laughs> position for anyone that has to make the decision, and they're not trained on making that decision. Where if you put an insurance component in place, they're equally as they have an equal interest in determining if there's a true disability event because that engages the insurance policy, which helps mm -hmm. fund the business. So it's really interesting. And that's where this business concept is transferable. I, again, I thought I'll need years of 
you know, accruing acumen in this to be able to really implement that with outside yeah. of the insurance business, which is my whole career, but it's happening already, which is super exciting. That's awesome. So I guess in your business career, what do you think the key to your success was that got you to the point that you're at now? I mean, I'm going to, you know, not, not to be, make you feel embarrassed, Randy, but working with folks like you, right. Where honestly, locally, that was the whole concept. The whole reason I left Liberty Mutual at the, on the onset, which I shared was mm -hmm. building something local that could become national, right. At some yep. point or, or international, I mean, who, you know, who knows the sky's the limit for all of us. Right. Mm -hmm. But, you know, leaning on those relationships, continuing to engage with the local community. I mean, Randy, you remember, and I know we got to bring it back, man. Uh, we used to do the boat cruise, right? Like things like that. Oh, and stuff yeah. Give back to There's local no community. reason we can't bring that back. We need to bring that back. And I think if people hear us talk about this, they're going to be pissed off that we haven't. And that's our fault, partly my fault, having, you know, changing jobs, starting a business, having two children. I got nothing going on. So I totally should have just done that. But I will make sure that we put it back on. So, you know, I just think <clears throat> really remembering where you came from, you know, I'll just give a, a you know, a quick story. So our high school hockey team was inducted into the Bitterford Hall of Honor. No big deal. But, you know, it was, <laughs> but it was cool, right? Going back to the high school, going in and, and uh, seeing all those folks again. And a lot of which, which I thought was really cool. I have taught, I've spoken to since then. Like you just haven't let those relationships go mm -hmm. and everyone finds their own path in business, whether they're a business owner or they're an employee of a company that we have, you know, clear, you know, synergy to work with. And that's really the, the tried and true tested path to success, especially in a state like Maine is just putting yourself out there. And, and again, I, I, I think that that's the biggest thing. If I could give anyone advice is. Take a step back. Come up, if you come up with an idea, take a step back and be like, who do I know? Right? Mm -hmm. Who do I know that I can actually help? It's, a, it's, a, it's got to be a two-way street. I think all too often, especially in insurance, folks are like, I'll engage with this person, but the only thing I'm thinking about is I hope to do their insurance with me. Mm -hmm. And you need to be really creative as to what can I give back to them? And Randy, I think that's really where our relationship, you know, not, not personally, but professionally, really started to work where... You know, I was at that age where folks were starting families and buying houses. Yeah. It's like every single person that asked me, I'm like, I don't care who you go and do your pre-qualification with, but if you don't call Randy, like you're an idiot, like try. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Which is, which it's been a great relationship for both of us that way. Cause it was, yeah. you know, for me, it was, there was only one person to call when it came to insurance stuff, you know? So it was like, just call Jordan, you know? So, but it was a mutually beneficial relationship for sure. You know, and then the friendships form and all that stuff, but it did make sense from both points of view, our business yeah. relationship. Yeah. And I, and I, you know, the thing with, with folks that would come to us even still now is as a consulting firm, we're not writing the actual insurance, right? We're, mm -hmm. we're finding the right person to write the right insurance policy if there's mm -hmm. a need for that. And that's how we operated at the beginning. You know, we, when I worked for a carrier, we had a set, you know, suite of products and if it didn't work, I had relationships outside. So, you know, folks like you knew if you sent it to, you know, Jordan's MetLife office, even if I wasn't writing it, we're going to take care of the customer. We're going to get in the right way. And, you know, customer would be happy. So. Mm -hmm. so pivot back to the current company. What are some of the biggest challenges that you're facing? I guess, if any, it's not, it sounds like things are going much better than you would have anticipated, but like, still, what are the things that, that come up here that are hard for you? Sure. Yeah. I mean, you know, once the business is off and running it, you know, you kind of get the administrative pieces set up. It's, I guess the biggest thing, especially in the insurance industry, which I referenced earlier, and I know others have shared when they've come on the podcast, it's, it's a really hard time. So folks are needing to take care of the thing that's right in front of them, which is their customer who's having mm -hmm. issues, whether it be with price, whether it be with coverage limitations. I mean, I'm sure if you talk to anyone that's listening, you talk to insurance agents, they're going to tell you like, this is the hardest time in my career, because I don't care how long, if you're still currently alive, it's the hardest time in your career yeah. in the insurance business even if your entire career has been in insurance on the distribution side where you're dealing, you're talking and dealing with carriers and customers directly. So that's the hardest challenge is getting folks to kind of pick their head up from their desk and really understand, listen, you know, although rates are going up and, and you're needing to play defense every day, you need mm -hmm. to think that this, like all things will change. I always liken it to, you know, could the cost of gas be less than $2? Yes. But, the oil companies have recognized that the market can support paying more. So it's never right. going to go back that direction. It's the yes. same with insurance, same with anything else. Genesis of inflation, supply and demand. 
So I think that folks are still getting used to that. And they, and like all good insurance companies and agents, they protect the customer they have more than anything. It's more important than the new customer, right? It's that mm -hmm. relationship that customer you already have because customer acquisition is so expensive and so yeah. time consuming. And it, it's the same in your business, Randy, right? So, you know, I, I think that that's the biggest challenge. But once we, I get to roll up my sleeves with these agency principals and their, you know, key agents and decision makers, they're on board, right? They understand we're here to help. You know, is there revenue to be made on our side? Absolutely. I mean, we're running a business, but it really is, it's mutually beneficial and the customers are getting better support, which, you know, mm -hmm. I've, I mentioned some of the companies I worked work for, great companies, right? On the management level, you know, this is, I'm back to feeling like I'm truly helping again, where before it was just kind of managing, right? Yeah. And, and doing the corporate thing. Now it's like, no, I'm, I'm li literally helping people, yeah. which you get to a place in your career where that starts to become really important more than money. It's like, no, yeah. I, I want to make enough money so I'm happy and I don't have to worry about it, but helping people is really cool. You know, and I think we're, we're really getting back to that. So long way to answer your question. I think just the ecosystem of the market is the challenge, but everyone's dealing with it. It's not unique to me. So it's not unique to your industry too. I mean, I think right. we talk about how hard it is to be in the insurance business right now. It's not really much different in the mortgage business and a lot of other businesses too, where there's labor issues and cost issues. And, you know, it's, it's a weird time. You know, there's no doubt about that, but, Absolutely. but there, but even then people find ways to be successful in these tough times, you know? So yeah, someone yeah. has to be. Yeah. There's a lot of agencies out there. that are telling me like, we're, we're having one of the better years you've had in a long time. I think they've yeah. just been, they're better, better positioned than others to take advantage of opportunities of the efforts they put in before, you know, this climate change of yeah. the business. And, you know, listen, I'm helping other agents kind of get caught up. That's really what we're doing. Mm -hmm. Is there a golden goose type referral that you're looking to get connected to? I mean, you don't have to be specific by name if you don't want to, but like you talked about some of the companies you do work with, but like who, who are you trying to get connected with? Yeah. I mean, specific to the insurance business, which I know is kind of like its own thing. You're either in it or you're not, right? But everybody knows somebody because you're legally required to, if you drive, to have yeah, something. And I will say, and this is not to give a plug for anything other than I hope it's with the local insurance agent. I can't say that enough. I know I've heard other people say that on your podcast, but coming as an outsider that doesn't write insurance anymore, you should do that. Yeah. <laughs> it's so yeah. So like, that's the biggest thing. Like anyone listening to this, like, yeah, I freaking love Jordan Fields. I love what he's saying. Like he wants to be connected to, to anyone. It's that yeah. local agent. Yeah. Well, yeah. The local agents are great because I mean, they're, even if it's, they don't own the business, they don't own the agency. I, I meet with those folks all the time as preliminary. And I say, Hey, listen, with this type of service, I help you in your business. They're like, yeah, I'm like, make an introduction for me then. Let me talk to the decision maker in your business. You know, you know that that's that's really the bread and butter. That was the genesis of this. There's obviously lots of other offshoots that are going on, but you know where I'm very impactful is with anybody that works in the insurance business, and they don't have to be the person selling it, right? If you have a friend or family member that's like, oh, they're an underwriter for a local company, they're the fr they're in the front office staff, they're a customer mm -hmm. service representative. I don't care. Those are great conversations because I know that I can strike a nerve with almost anybody. Yeah. That could lead to a bigger conversation that will ultimately, hopefully trickle down, help them regardless of what their role is. We're finding mm -hmm. that is happening over and over again. We have yet, I have yet to meet with an agency owner that has not contracted with us where, where we have a hundred percent ratio on creating some sort of alignment. All of them are a little different, but that's intentional, right? It's what I'm identifying it with them that they need, but nobody's yet said, thanks, but no thanks. Yeah. Yeah. I want to pivot to something else and it's parenting, managing, starting a new business, all that sort of stuff. You have a new baby daughter, kid number two. It's yep. been two, what, two months? <clears throat> yeah, she's actually months. a little bit further. She's going to be turning four months next week. Yeah, four months. Me too. Time flies. Yeah. How are you finding managing the uh, the dad life and, and the parenting role with this business that you are really like, you know, six, seven months into? Yeah, right. So when you're running a business upstairs and your daycare is downstairs, that's why I'm not in my house right now. Recording this podcast, <laughs> right? It's like, listen, if one of the kids wakes up, we got to re-record the whole thing, man. It was, yeah, I, you know, someone was nice enough to let me come in and record. But yeah, no, I, it's, it's, it's hard, but it's not impossible, right? Now, I will say, I, I tell folks, I was working from home before working from home was cool. 
yeah. right? Like pre-COVID, you know, in my management role, I was traveling a lot, which obviously stopped completely during COVID. And then we got creative and we adapted to that. So a lot of it was still virtual. So I'm used to it. And honestly, I think that not like I'm thankful for COVID, that's a ridiculous concept, but like I am thankful for already being comfortable with that even before COVID. So when yeah. folks were trying to figure out, I was like, this is just business as usual. The difference yeah. is our happy hours are virtual as opposed to, you know, somewhere like local. Other than that, everything was, you know, kind of business as usual. So, you know, adding kids into the fold, it's been great, man. I mean, it's yeah. so much fun. It also, and, and you know this, it, it gives you, especially being a business owner or like really running your own business where your efforts are, are directly correlated to your revenue and your take home pay. It, it's a whole different type of drive. <clears throat> and like I alluded to earlier, where, you know, the concept of kind of like, say giving back, but, you know, being present locally and, and you know, feeling like you're actually helping something, you know, local business owners, it, it all ties together, right? Yeah. Because I know when they get, when, when they grow up and they're in school, hopefully, you know, if I'm helping somebody now and, and I need help with something else, then it'll be reciprocated, right? I, I'm a true believer in that. I know that sounds super holistic and, you know. I There's don't truth to, to that though, man. There is truth yeah. to that sort of stuff. Yeah. Like being part of the community and as you have kids, it, it, your involvement in the community and your business life, that all evolves but it is still very much connected yeah you know i mean i, I just think of like next time we go to a bit of a football game walking up and seeing jordan and randy forcer's name on whatever row of steps that is right you know from hey that donate. is because we and i should clarify have a row that is dedicated to us for the brokers we did you know but right. do that right. sort of stuff there's benefits all around yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's too much inside baseball. But, you know, if you ever go to a high school game and you trip over it, you're going to trip over the Randy and Jordan step. You're like, I, yeah, I figure it's, it's the best row. It's like, row for like the row that you want. Best, best view of the game. <laughs> so, but yeah, no, man, it's cool. It's it's awesome. We're having we're having a ton of fun. Kids are great. Older son loves the, you know, Alina, our daughter. And, you know, they're just they're, they're having a blast together. And, you know, we're figuring it out. You know, I just got to record podcast not in my house. Yeah, exactly. Well, dude, I see where you're at now. It was me, you know, seven years ago, eight years ago, something like that. You know, a couple of kids that, that are under, well, how old's Jameson? Is he two? He's turning two this weekend, actually. Yes. And I, I, it's like when we, you know, Randy, we, we got together, it was like two or three weeks ago over lunch. And you're like, are you good? I'm like, I haven't slept, man. Like I, <laughs> when I say I haven't, like you learn to live off of, I was always a night, night owl. Like I would watch whatever sporting event would be on until yeah. I would watch like, Canadian hockey that would end at you know one thirty in the morning and then yeah. that was normal but it's a different type of tired right uh, such kind of tired. And I was like when I say I haven't slept I didn't sleep and it wasn't for fun like, <laughs> like, like, it was miserable <laughs> was literally the it's, worst it sucked it's because I had a baby crying on my lap for like four hours in the middle of the night yeah yeah three <laughs> in the morning uh, I, I, it got to the point where you know a couple times I've woken up at three with like you know sleep regression for parents out there you're like yeah i know and uh, didn't go back to bed so i got a text message from someone like did you go to bed before you sent me that email or <laughs> were you still awake or were you up that early because you emailed me at three like i was awake i have two kids <laughs> but you know what man i was just talking to someone about this today being self-employed and having that drive for business because your income is directly tied to the work that you do and all that stuff you know that can run your life if you aren't aware of it but like at the same time it does afford you a lot of flexibilities in your life to be involved with your family and you know you can work from home and spend time with your kids during the day and you know when they're in school you'll be able to pick them up from school or drop them off or go to their sporting events and all that stuff so you know as hard as you are working now there are definitely benefits that you will feel at some point you probably already are feeling yeah, absolutely yeah i mean you know it, it's it i feel for folks that are in a position you know especially with like i call it the daycare crisis right where it's like you know, with COVID, they shut down for a week, like kids are home, we're paying for the week, even though we were only there, only there one day, like it's, it's hard. So when we have those crisis moments, I try to just juggle the schedule and, you know, I'm run I run daddy daycare as my second business, man. I, and it's, I don't get paid for that. You I do not get paid for that. You got to do that. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like you saying that or, or reminding me of the times where we pay for a full week of daycare, but it would get shut down. You're like, oh, that like, I feel like I want to do a whole podcast on that topic. That's like, were very like close to my heart. I would die during those times. Kills me. Killed me. I have plenty of people that would come on and talk to you about that. Oh, man. <laughs> and I get it. You know, I mean, they, they need their money too, but man, it was just a wild time back then, you know? Oh, yeah. Absolutely, man. Yeah. Crazy stuff. Well, I, listen, I, you know, I was, remember sitting up last night watching the Celtics, just thinking, 
Man, are we going to see 18? Is this going to happen? I mean, dude, I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, but like, it feels like we are the superior team. You know, when we can, and I love Piven, I'll, I'll talk sports any day as we wrap up the pod, but like, it feels like we suck in game twos. Everything that they that need to go right, like in terms of Luca playing a really good game, us not hitting shots, Jalen having a pretty like average to to below average game, and we still somehow won. Like I don't know. I mean, I don't know. I don't know. I, I mean, I, I never thought we'd sweep them, but I really wouldn't be surprised if we swept them. Yeah, I mean, I know Luca's banged up, but like I watched some clips today of Jalen just like lockdown defense from you know like cameras in the crowd you know, behind the net and it's incredible. And, you know, there's a lot of people that were, you know, poo-pooing on Tatum's game, obviously in the first half he shot horrible, but like watching him become a facilitator and just like understanding like he needs to do that. It was, I was texting back. I'm like, actually, this is a better brand of basketball for me to watch mm -hmm. because he's just, we don't give enough credit. Like, you know, he can be pretty pompous at times, like referring to himself as one of the greatest basketball basketball players in the league, which at times he is. He definitely has the capabilities to be that. But yeah, I don't know, man. It was, it was fun to watch. I'm I'm fired up for hockey. I'm heavy on Edmonton. So are you I'm, heavy yeah. on them because you're a McDavid guy or you have money on them? Like, why are you heavy on Edmonton? All of those reasons, but mainly because <laughs> I want to see a Canadian team win. I think because they're, they're going to lose their freaking minds if they win. Yeah, it's going to be wild. I mean, we've seen some of the clips coming out of there. Great fans, great fan base. Yeah. They're 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 crazy up there. And you know, even at their watch parties, man, it's like the yeah. game's actually being played there. I don't know. I big hockey guy. I've come around to them a little bit. I want to see McDavid get it, man. I mean, he's been in the league for nine years. He's Stug. arguably the best to ever do it. I mean, I know not like Stanley Cup wins and points would be hard to catch. Wayne. But like what he's capable of on the ice. Like, yeah, it's like no one. You ask any hockey player, like he just has another level. And if you're yeah. a hockey fan and you watch it, you're like that's. It's a wild season. And so. guys like that should win Stanley Cups. I had a yeah. friend that is a big Edmonton fan randomly, and he flew out there for the last round. Him and another buddy of mine said it was insane. You know, I uh, saw, yeah. saw the videos. Like, the fans are the best. It's the you, best. Know? It, you know, unlike other professional sports, I think hockey more than any of them, I think, you know, if you don't win a cup, you, you just, you, it's, it's a barrier to, a barrier to entry as being viewed as one of the greatest. Like, if you don't win mm -hmm. a cup, you just never, that's why the whole Ovechkin thing was such a big deal. They were just like, you know, he's, pressuring Wayne for like, you know, goals. Yeah. And at the same time, they're like, but it won't matter if he doesn't win a cup. So when he did, I don't care if you're a captain. That was awesome when he won the cup. Yeah. It's just like, he was I, loving every second of it. He <laughs> had a good time as he should. As yeah. He should. Rightfully so. I mean, Hey, I yeah. freaking love that guy because of that. Is Florida going to win though? I hope not. Just they obviously won game one and they took yeah. us out the past couple of years and they seem to be pretty freaking good, but I'm not as much of a hockey guy as you. I don't know. For those hockey folks that are listening, and if there's Florida fans, sorry, but if I see Bennett lift the cup above his head, I'm gonna mom it, man. Like I just can't. I just can't cheer for that team just because I get it. It's an attitude. Listen, when I was a hockey player, as a football player on skates, I get being physical. I probably probably led Biddeford High School my senior year. If there was a Hall of Honor for penalty minutes and ejections from games, I'd probably be in the Hall of Honor myself. So I get it. I get that style, but at the same time, man, like. I don't know. It's there's too, too much skill in the NHL, and it's just frustrating to to see. I mean, I don't know. We'll have to see how it goes. I my my heart says Edmonton, but my head says Florida will probably win in six. But you know, don't quote me. But that's it's annoying. annoying. It's annoying. Yeah. We'll see. All right, dude. That's a good way to wrap it up. What's yeah. the best way for people to find information about your company? Contact you? Anything? Yeah, I honestly, right now, it's all direct to me. We're in the process of uh, rolling out some marketing websites and different collateral deliverables right now. You know, my email is jordan at Atlantic Financial Consultants. Or I'm sorry, my that's my my LinkedIn. My email is jordan at atlanticfc.org. Mm -hmm. um, so if folks have questions, they want to, you know, they just want to have a conversation. Like we're not charging per DM to have a conversation, right? So if anyone wants to reach out or get in touch with Randy, yeah. if you have a contact with him, he knows he's got my, my personal deets. So he can get you in touch yeah. Yeah. Totally. This has been great, man. I finally feel like I made it. Yeah, I'm Big gonna go, deal. I'm going to go like celebrate because I did the pot. I did it. It's really life affirming. Yeah, this is definitely a milestone. So of all the things here, right? I had I had my second child. I started the business. This is like <laughs> one A or one yeah. B. Like we're yeah. Yeah, dude. It's big deal. Well, yeah. listen, you're the man. I appreciate you coming on. Dude, we'll, we'll do it again, and we'll find some other. I mean, what we just we agree that we're going to do some public like current event type stuff. You know, yeah. get into politics. We'll do that next time. Yeah, yeah. We're gonna talk some current events. We're gonna we're gonna talk about 
some stuff. You won't want to miss that podcast because it'll be all conspiracy theories between Randy yeah. and I, and it will be really engaging stuff. For Maybe sure. an election special? Should we Ooh. do? We you can know, do I'll, do, I'll do my best Trump and Biden impression, oh, and uh, yeah, we'll each pick one, and we'll 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 practice <laughs> until then. And uh, we'll, should we just do the pod like full, like you Donald Trump the whole time, me Biden the whole time? Like we'll just. It, I don't know. We have we have some work ahead of us, but I think we have some good good ideas coming. Yeah, I'll get dude. I'll I'll get in costume, man. Like we'll do this. <laughs> All right, bud. I'll look forward to it, man. We'll talk All soon. Right. See you, everyone. Thanks. Right. See ya.